Welcome back, everybody, to Buried Chapter 4. The ride up the elevator is tense. I take a series of deep breaths, doing everything I can to stay in control. Amy has gotten back to her feet, but her head is pressed against the elevator wall as she suppresses a series of sobs. I find myself trying to remember the way those creatures looked, but my mind seems to shudder at the effort. I have seen something that is an impossibility, a mockery of what I know is real. This fills me with a terror that dwarfs anything else I have ever felt discovering in this facility. I try to focus my mind on something else and remember Marcus's threat. I wonder if we'll see Marcus again, I say mostly to myself. Do you think Marcus got away from those things? Amy asked. I sort of hope not. Me too, she says, looking at the ground, her arms folded. So, I say, how did you end up here? She gives a nervous chuckle and shrugs. I used to work with the Pentagon. It was some pretty upper echelon stuff that I still can't discuss. I assume this place is even more upper echelon, I said. This place isn't even on the scale, she answers. My other job was a cakewalk compared to this. Then why stay? I ask. Because the money's ridiculous. I have a 13-year-old daughter already talking about Harvard. You do the math. Harvard, huh? That's ambitious. Oh, I know. She's a force of nature. Her dad ran off when she was three, so for a long time it's just been her and me. Amy pauses before continuing softly. What if I never see... Her voice breaks off, the words too terrible to say. Her eyes fill with tears. The elevator comes to a stop, the slight ding of it interrupting the moment. Amy hastily wipes her eyes, and we waste no time in getting back inside the command center. I ready the rifle. Suddenly certain that there are more of those creatures waiting for us in the hallway of the second level. But the way is clear, allowing us to haul ass to the command center. Once again, I find myself staring at the screen that shows my ruined work site. Okay, okay, Amy says, typing commands rapidly. It can't be that hard. I keep peeking over my shoulder, my senses feeling as if the monsters are sneaking up on us, mere inches away. I then think of Dennis and wonder how he's faring back on level 3. Is he safe? I look back to the screens and see that Amy has finally found what she's looking for. A prompt on the screen says, Override of hangar doors in all level 3 locks requires clearance code. Amy types in a number with a shaking finger, and the screen goes black for a moment. The moment the words override confirmed come up on the screen, Amy jumps up from the chair and heads out of the room. We have to be quick. She says, we have exactly 20 minutes to open those hangar doors. What happens in 20 minutes? The locks will kick in again, she says. Security measures, I, I couldn't do anything about it. I follow her out of the command center and bound back down the hallway towards the same elevator that brought us there. Amy punches the elevator button and the doors slide open. We're taking the same elevator back to the biochem room? I ask. Those creatures are still down there. It's the only way back down, she says. The other way is blocked by the hydraulic doors we pulled. Hopefully the creatures left. Hopefully. Neither of us say anything else as we share a look of immense dread. We step back into the elevator and head back down to the biochem room on level 3. As the elevator doors open, we peer out, looking to see if the creatures are still in the area. But it's all clear, save that strange green chemical leaking out of the tank I accidentally shot. The moss has started to expand and climb up the sides of some of the tanks. I'm distracted for a moment before realizing we need to move. When Amy looks to me, her eyes are clear and strong. Marcus wasn't entirely wrong, Amy says as we start walking back towards the hangar doors. About what? I ask about how I'm partially to blame for this. I mean, she's kind of just doing her job. I don't know who you would blame for this. It's a, it's, it's kind of like a, a situation where there's a lot of people involved and 
I mean, somebody made the, the call to do this. Uh, she's not the head scientist. She's not the one giving the clear all for all these things. So I wouldn't really say that she's to blame. Um, for me, at least, science is something that we need to continually press. And there needs to be something in place to say, you know, should we do this? Not can we do it? But I don't think that was her job because she wasn't at the uh, the top of the, the ladder there. So I wouldn't blame her. So all of that to say, why would you be to blame? Some of these things we do here, it's scary. We should have known that one day something like this would happen. Everyone here with knowledge of what goes on in level three is to blame, she says. It's a highly advanced research facility, I say, doing amazing but risky stuff. So yeah, you're partially to blame by just working here, but I can understand the dedication. So why don't you tell me a bit more about what does go on in level three, I ask. Are you familiar with the Large Hadron Collider over in Switzerland? I've heard the phrase, but that's about it, I say. It's a powerful particle accelerator, she explains. Right now, they're just using it to try and create what's called dark matter. It's theorized that this dark matter actually makes up the majority of the universe, but parts of the universe very different from ours. My guess is the people at the LHC will probably create their first dark matter particle in about 2018 or, or 2019. Here in this facility, we were able to create one almost 10 years ago, it was the key to our research. So what does this matter do? We use dark matter to assist with the instantaneous transfer of a subject, but we have yet to perfect it or understand why it works. So you're saying it lets you gain access to different dimensions, I ask. That's the theory, she says. During the point to point transfer, the subjects are gone for about three to six seconds. There's no way to see or measure their presence, but they exist somewhere. From what we can tell, they exist in a kind of void. Have you done this with people? We, we have sent human subjects through. Almost all of them have returned successfully. I make an involuntary grimace. Almost. There, there was one man, Dr. Kana, who didn't return. We don't know where... She trails off, taking a moment to collect herself. Sorry, I asked, I say, feeling my mind start to bend inward again. As we continue to walk between the silos, we walk past the area where we left Marcus behind, but he's long gone. Maybe he found a way out. I realize that we're walking very close together between the silos, perhaps trying to create the illusion of safety. We reach the exit connecting to the hangar doors, where Dennis hopefully still is. My guts clench and my heart hammers in my chest as we open the door and walk through. I lift the rifle, but at first it seems that there is nothing waiting for us. And that's when I see the glowing, hulking shape to my left, closing in fast. The creature is about 10 feet away and coming in quickly. So I do the first thing that comes to mind. I drop to the ground, making myself a smaller target, and raise the rifle. I'm not sure if I should just unload on the bastard, or try to be choosy with my shots and weaken it, or at least slow it down. Well, we know that shooting it doesn't really do much, so we're going to shoot to weaken. We're going to be choosy with our shots. Maybe we can find a weak point. My shot causes the entire milky white frame to jerk to the floor. It flounders, its ghost-like tentacles writhing with rage as it cries out to me. It seems to turn and jerk away, parts of it appearing and disappearing every few feet. It moves down the hall and out of sight. I look quickly around for others, but there's only Amy. She looks at where the monster went with wide eyes. Her face is pale, and I wonder if, like me, she's able to feel her mind trying to retreat. Come on, I say, let's find Dennis. Get through those hangar doors. Amy glances at her watch and nods. We're already down to six minutes. We turn towards the hangar doors and I'm a little disgusted with myself because the bloody scene that so shocked me before now seems mild. Amy goes to work on the computer console on the side of the doors. She starts punching in keys before saying, this, this is gonna take some time. I thought you already unlocked it, I asked. I did, she says, but for this door, there's still security permissions I need to hack. Uh, Marcus would have known how to do this. She trails off, and I decide to let her work. Suddenly, something slams into me. I 
feel my feet leave the floor and I am literally thrown across the concrete. I look up in time to see one of the creatures. It's apparently in no hurry to attack me again, focusing on Amy instead. She's not armed. I need to come up with a plan to get this thing away from her so she can focus on getting the door open. It raises one of its flickering appendages, making me certain that part of its makeup is pure light and energy. I could easily take a shot with my rifle, but my mind again goes to how much remaining aim ammo I have. The only other thing I can think of is to get it to chase me and lead it away from this room, somewhere. Uh, well, we got the other one to go away by shooting it, so maybe I know where the weak point is, so let's shoot it. I lift the rifle groggily and fire as quickly as I can. Not having good footing and still reeling from the attack, the aim is off, but the noise of it distracts the monster from Amy. The monster turns to me and I am again face to face with something that has no business being in this world, in this reality. Its body gives off a sort of glow around the central part, a bulbous core that is branched off into two humps, very much like a spider. Again, I sense that this visual information is not accurate but it's the best I can do to make sense of this impossible creature. I pull the trigger again, the shot taking the monster directly in the center. It spasms backwards and lets out a shriek of agony that makes my ears feel like they'll explode. From somewhere very close by, another creature cries out in response. You okay? I ask Amy. I can clearly see her battling for control of her faculties. Steel determination wins out and she gives a grim nod. Any sign of where Dennis went? I ask, hoping she hasn't noticed his body somewhere. Uh, no, she replies. It's then that I realize that I have no idea how many rounds I have remaining in the rifle. This isn't a model I'm familiar with. Outside of some deer hunting, I'm not much of an expert on firearms. Still, I'm able to locate the chamber easily and see that there were only two rounds left. I silently curse myself for being too trigger happy earlier. How are we on time? I ask her. Four minutes. Going as fast as I can, she says. Amy does her best to focus on the keyboard, but there's still no sign of Dennis. Before I have time to look around, a screeching sound erupts from the other end of the room. I bring the rifle up in a shooter stance and turn around. With the hangar doors right behind me, no sign of Dennis, and a closing window of time, I have to be confident. Yet, when two monsters come around the corner, my body wants to shut down. The appendages seem to jump in time and space reaching out for a split second, independent of the body, and then disappearing back to where they came from. It churns and screeches at me, its glowing tentacles snaking out of its body. My knees tremble uncontrollably. Behind me, Amy shrieks. I feel myself losing control, my mind sliding into the abyss of insanity. I pull myself back from the brink. I've got to stay in control. All right, well, if I only have two shots left, let's see if we can lead these guys on a chase. I could stand here and use my last two shots, but what good would that do? So instead, I turn to face the hangar doors. How much longer before we can open these things? Not long, Amy says, furiously typing into the terminal as commands flood the screen. I doubt it, I think to myself. Can I do anything to help? I ask. She doesn't answer, deep in concentration. I turn back around and see a looming shape appear. The creature comes around the corner, screaming out that static-like sound. I step away from Amy and the hangar doors and towards the monster, ready to defend her. I ready my rifle, but the creature wastes no time. It makes that jerky motion towards me, and there's a sharp pain in my chest as it collides with me. So I guess no running. Or through me. It's actually kind of hard to tell. My instinct is to try to grapple or hold this thing down, but then I realize I don't even know if that will work. Um. Ah. Uh, well, I'm going to try to get away. If we try to grapple it, it might, like, melt us. I figure I'd rather not try to learn more about the physical nature of this thing right now. I tuck and roll away from it, then stand up to face it. With a scream of defiance, I raise the rifle and put a round in its core. The shot lands dead center, and the light inside of it flickers almost violently. It falls back against the wall, issuing a hiss of its telltale static noise. It then jerks away and retreats, at least for now. Another terror appears as if out of nowhere, screaming at me with its high-pitched whine. It bounds forward, charging in its strange spastic way. 
I aim the rifle, intending to take this one in the core, too. I take several... Hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute now. <laughs> several shots? I only had one left. I take several shots, but it's still coming at me. As it slams into me, I pull the trigger again, and I realize that my rifle is now empty. On contact, the wind is knocked out of my lungs, and the back of my head strikes the floor. But neither of these things is as alarming as the fact that the beast is on top of me. Its exterior is like a seashell that has been pounded by the surf for so long that it has lost all its edges and ridges. But the grip it tries to capture me with is pure violence. I feel these light-soaked appendages start to wrap around me. I raise the rifle, knowing it is empty, but hoping to use it as a wedge to push the thing off of me. The weight of the monster is erratic. One moment, I feel weightless. Another, I feel like I'm going to be crushed. I push upwards with the rifle. The monster budges a bit, but almost seems to absorb it, warping it into its grip. I see the core of its body, a spider-like shape, connected to the rest of it by thin white strings of tissue. I'll be dead within seconds unless I can fend it off or get help. All right, well, we're dead if Amy stops trying to get into the door anyway, so let's punch it. You know me, I punch things and I help people. I do my best to give one last heave to push it off, but my hands melt through. I curse myself for wasting so many bullets earlier. Two of its appendages wrap around my left shoulder and I feel a white hot pain fill my body. The tentacles burn and I realize that some are actually going through my shoulder like a kid pulling apart the stitches of a doll. But then I see the creature extend its tentacle in aggravation while making that static screeching sound. The creature flickers, releasing me suddenly. With a shudder and a cry of desperation, I roll away from it and see that a large hole has appeared in its luminous core. The creature disappears into thin air and reappears a few feet from me, retreating back towards the biochem room. Amy looks over at me from her terminal at the hangar doors looking petrified. Dennis stands several feet away, holding a shotgun. Hell yeah! He walks slowly towards us and is clearly just as scared and out of sorts as we are. You okay, boss? He asks, but his eyes aren't on me. They are looking to the creature, trying to understand exactly what he has just seen. About 15 minutes ago, I heard the door to that maintenance room unlock, Dennis says, pointing to the room I tried to bust my way into earlier. Oh, Amy says. When I did the override up in the command center, it unlocked all the small doors down here, including that maintenance room. I went inside there and hid, Dennis continues. And while I was waiting for you to come back, I found a massive trunk. There were a few guns in it, so I grabbed this one, he says, patting his shotgun. I'm glad you're safe, Dennis. I reassure people it's what I do. Thanks, boss, he says. Me too. She doesn't break eye contact with the panel. Almost done, she replies. Suddenly, without warning, a shot ricochets off the wall behind Amy's head. Startled, we look around, confused. Did Dennis's gun go off? When another shot blasts near us again, we all drop to the floor. I look around, wondering who or what could possibly be shooting at us. Those creatures don't do anything that sounds remotely like gunfire. And then I see him. Marcus. God damn it. I should have killed him when I had the chance. Alright, you're right. Should have done it. He has a rifle and is walking towards us, an insane look in his eyes. You all deserve to die, he screams, unleashing another round that I hear whiz by my head. Dennis doesn't hesitate. He stands up, shoots at Marcus, causing him to retreat. God damn it! God damn it, Marcus! I let you live! I punch you in the face and let you live! Why are you doing this to us, man? He should know better. I don't, I don't get it. God, he didn't... He's just going to get more attention to himself. He's going to die. I don't understand this because he's like going on a crusade against us to kill us because it's our fault that these things are here. But he's just going to get himself killed in the process. It makes absolutely no sense. I know he's insane. I'm still going to critique what he's doing as stupid. All right. <sighs> all right. Rant over. How much longer, Amy? Almost there, she says quietly. She makes a few final key presses and says, done doors open with the noise of hydraulics and a whoosh of air. With Marcus pinned down by Dennis's gunfire, we start moving towards the doors. At that moment, another creature jerks into existence around the corner, between us and Marcus. 
Shit, Marcus says, and starts unloading into it. But then he learns the same lesson we did. This only slows the creature down. Marcus gives us one last look and then turns and runs off in another direction. Dennis, Amy, and I climb up and ahead through the doors, moving on nothing more than adrenaline. I see her look longingly at the maintenance room Dennis took the shotgun from. You get into the hangar, Dennis says. I'll get some more firepower. Satisfied with the plan, Amy heads through the door. We scramble inside, finally inside the hangar. Dennis approaches me from behind, holding several guns and looking like a kid who grabbed an armful of Halloween candy. Amy reaches out for a 9mm with one hand. Dennis turns to me and holds out a shotgun and a handgun for me to choose. Both look deadly. The shotgun looks more powerful, but the handgun will probably be more precise. Well, we know that the handgun, or whatever gun we had before, had minimal effect on the guys. I could make them stagger, but not too much. Whereas when Dennis actually shot them with a shotgun, a actual hole appeared in it, and it really, really scared it. So I'm taking the shotgun. That seems like a better, better decision there. I take the shotgun, surprised at how heavy it feels, but also invigorated by its weight. There are more creatures coming, as many as a dozen. They're floating down the hall quickly, their tentacles slithering. The way their light seems to mingle together is almost beautiful. Close the door, I yell at Amy. She dashes to another terminal mounted on the inside of the hangar and tries desperately to close them. It's not working, she says with tears in her eyes. This terminal's disabled. Dennis looks through the open doors, readying himself to shoot the first monster that nears us. Should we try to slow a few down or just run for it? He asks, his gun at the ready. Um, okay, so if there's like a dozen of them and there's two guys with a shotgun, I say let's run for it. Running seems to be better. If you slow down one, then it's just gonna, you know, be overtaken by the others. Good idea, says Amy. With that, we turn around and sprint out into the hangar floor. The room is enormous, so large that to call it a room seems silly. A large concrete floor stretches out below an expansive lofted ceiling. The area is mostly empty, except for one side which has rows and rows of metal barrels. Back on the far wall, it's a lit area that seems to expose more rooms, labs, and machinery. Also in the rear of the hangar, I can see some kind of chamber or control center. Dennis and I follow Amy across the hangar floor. Behind us, a series of rough, slithering sounds tells us that the creatures have made it their way into the hangar. From somewhere up ahead, a loud buzzing noise sounds out. It reminds me of the slight buzzing noise I'd heard in the forest, the noise that I've tried to avoid. I look ahead and see that in the far back of the hangar, a bright red light is flashing. There's a small hatch or door below the light. That hatch is open, and I can see a shape inside it. I can barely make out the figure of a man standing there, holding an industrial microphone. And as soon as I see him, I hear his huge amplified voice. It blares down over an intercom system, and he sounds pissed. I don't know who the hell you are, he says, but this is a government facility on lockdown and there are protocols to shit. I assume the curse coincides with the exact moment he sees the creatures. They're making their way through the hangar doors. There are about 20 feet between us and the creatures. I act instinctively, squeezing off two shots with a shotgun. See, this will be good. The first sprays low, hitting the floor and causing a shower of sparks. But the second shot causes one monster to jerk backwards. It's a good thing that a shotgun is quite forgiving. Amy and Dennis take the cue to start firing as well. The floor becomes littered with a swirling white fluid from the wounded creature's bodies. But they're not slowing down. The alarm keeps shrieking behind us, and when I turn to see if anything has changed back there, I trip over my feet. I hit the ground hard, and in an almost comic fashion, slide several feet across the floor. From the ground, I see that we have managed to turn back four of them, but I also see that my estimate of a dozen is off. There are at least twenty of them. Their sick, dim light sinister and gloomy. Their appendages seem to bind together as they come forward. 
My only hope of survival is that the man in the far doorway has somehow shut the hangar doors. His voice comes blaring over the intercom again, broken by the booming noise of the gunfire that we're laying down. Run here toward the isolation chamber! I'm not sure how much time we have. I realize that I can sprint ahead of Amy and Dennis, or I can hang back and give them cover. I would love to, to stay and, and shoot. However, I just like face planted and slid. I really feel like we should just run. I start sprinting as fast as I can towards the rear of the hangar. Dennis and Amy fall in behind me. I can feel the beast closing in on us. I anticipate feeling one of those tentacles slide over me at any moment. I hustle quickly, catching up to Amy and Dennis, who stop and turn to provide me with cover fire. There, Amy says, pointing to the small door where their man was standing earlier. The swarm is less than 15 feet away now, so furious that they're pushing through one another to get to us. I fire, still not quite used to the kick of the shotgun. I aim for the core of one, but the shot hits low. Still, it knocks the bastard back, giving me time to readjust. We're in the middle of the hangar floor now, with the isolation chamber ahead and the monsters behind. Beside me, Dennis also fires. The kick of the gun jolts him, probably a result of him being weakened from the blood loss. His shot lands true though, causing a jerking stumble and a flickering of its light. We're almost in, Amy yells as we get close to the door we hope will save us. Stash inside, we don't want to clog it up. I waste no time heading for the room. I basically leap towards the door, already feeling a little more secure. I nearly shout for joy when I reach the frame. But then I feel something hot seep into my back. Roger! Dennis yells. The pain in my back is so immense that I barely notice the fact that I'm being lifted from the floor. I look down and see that one of the creatures is using its flowing arms to grab me by the waist, its tentacles wrapping around me. It lifts me into the air as if presenting me as a trophy to its friends. I can't angle the shotgun to fire off around, so I bring the stock of it down on the monster's translucent, smooth body. It's like striking at fog. My attack has very little effect. As it continues to hoist me up, screeching its approval, Dennis comes back out of the room and fires off a shot. The bullet catches the monster on the underside of its core, sending it backwards, causing it to freeze for a moment. It releases me, and I hit the ground, dropping my gun, and again finding myself unable to breathe. I feel slightly dizzy, but this fades when I see Dennis is still standing outside the door. He's firing into the beast like a madman, and doesn't see the one to his left, coming in along the edge of the wall. Oh man. Alright, well we gotta push him out of the way. I try to dash towards Dennis to push him out of the way, but there's not enough time. The creature jerks out of existence and then reappears right behind him. By the time Dennis turns and sees the creature coming, it has already drawn several of its appendages back to strike. Dennis tries to raise his gun, but it's knocked away by one of the tentacles. A second tentacle strikes and Dennis is spun around and thrown off balance by the attack. Dennis catches himself before falling. A third tentacle wraps around Dennis's forearm and I can see it squeeze, tightening instantly. The tip of the appendage passes clean through his hand, its blood-soaked tip poking out through his palm. Dennis's face grimaces with pain as he tries to wrench his arm free, but the creature's tentacle has his hand speared like a nail through wood. In a moment of dark clarity, I realize that I can free him with a clean shot at the monster's tentacles, but it will likely mean blowing Dennis's hand off. Dennis! I yell over the creature's high-pitched static sound. Can he get free? I have I have a shot, maybe. No, Dennis gasps at the re as the creature tosses him around by the hand like a puppet. Don't shoot, I'd get free. I can't tell if he's right, but the other monsters are starting to encircle him. I need to act fast. All right, in all honesty, I would totally shoot off Dennis's hand. I mean, what is losing a hand to saving your life? But I'm gonna see what happens. Wait for Dennis to get away. Dennis is fighting hard, doing everything he can to bring the gun around with his good hand. He's screaming as he tries to tear his hand away, screaming in both fury and desperation. This only seems to anger the creature, which then swats Dennis with another of its tentacles, 
opening a deep gash across his cheek. His skin peels back and his eyes go wide with shock. The creature drops him to the ground, as if playing with him, and then the floor and the space around Dennis seems to warp. The bottom quarter of his body seems to disappear before I realize it's been merged with the floor. And at that moment, I know it's over. Three others swarm him, surrounding what remains of his fallen body. I don't even hear Dennis scream. There's just a frenzy of the crackling, sickening wail sound. After that, there's nothing else. Fury, sorrow, and absolute rage surge through my heart. I grab my gun as the remaining beasts come towards me. They'll kill me, but I don't care. This is war, as far as I'm concerned. This is... Amy grabs me from behind and pulls me hard inside. I try fighting her off, but she's persistent. And part of my mind knows she's right. Don't be an idiot, she yells to me. She practically throws me through the doorway. As I fall, I hear her fire off two more shots before slamming the door closed behind her. I watch blurrily as she punches a few buttons on the control pad on the wall. This is followed by a metallic click as the door locks. We're safe in the chamber, but Dennis is gone. Oh my god! I didn't- I actually- Okay, so here's the deal. I really didn't think they were actually gonna kill him off. So far with all of my decisions, nothing really bad has happened, so I didn't think they were actually gonna kill him. I just thought he would get away. How was I to know he was actually gonna die? Like I said, I totally would have shot off his hand. Who cares about losing your hand? Oh my god, that was awful. I regret, so much regret, so much regret. Okay, can't do anything about it. We're gonna continue. I'm so sorry, Dennis. I'm so sorry. I guess all my crew is gone now. We never even found the others. <clears throat> We're now inside a large reinforced chamber of sorts. Almost like the inside of a submarine. <coughs> Near us is the door, shut tight. Far away from us along the back wall are all sorts of controls and monitors. It seems clear that this metal door is impenetrable. At least to them. I'm fairly sure that they aren't getting in. Dennis, I say. I'm sorry, Amy says. And I'm sorry for pulling you back, but you're walking to your death out there. I know, I say. That doesn't make it any easier. I couldn't quite see, but it looked like you may have had a shot. Why didn't you take it? Amy asked. I thought he would get away. It's the truth. I really thought he would get away. Roger, Amy says. My god, I'm, I'm sorry. There's no way you could have known. Who did I think I was? Trying to bring him into this wretched place? Hoping to save his life? A lot of good that did. I ended up letting him die right in front of me anyway. Out of nowhere, an image of Dennis pumping his fist after winning a game of pool pops into my head. Dennis always wins, always gets away, except for this time. It's terrible for me to say, Amy says, but you're right, he's dead. But we're still alive, and we need to get out of here. How, I say, nearly mocking her. By taking it one thing at a time. We need to figure out how bad this is and how to get ourselves under control. And then, well, we're interrupted by a man's voice booming behind us. Just what the hell do you think you're doing? The man roars. He is an older man who seems to exude power and authority, but he also looks tired and scared. I assume this is Barksdale. He walks over to us from the back recesses of the chamber. We didn't have a choice, Amy responds. We had to. Did you override the locks on the hangar doors? Barksdale demands. Yes, I, I did, but we had to. Do you have any idea what you could have done? Amy doesn't answer right away. She is furious, but she's also scared and visibly exhausted. I'm just going to stay quiet. It don't matter none. Look, Barksdale, she says, you can berate me, lecture me all you want when this mess is over. But right now, I have a wounded civilian here, and as you can see, several entities trying to get into this room. So if you could actually do something instead of sitting on your throne and yelling at me, that would be great. I'm impressed by her guts, I wonder if there's some sort of beef between the two of them. Surely working in a place like this could cause some stress and tension between people. 
As we wait, I notice a small peephole in the door. I go to it and look out into the things. They're still looking for a way in, but finding no success. I wonder if they can sense or somehow see me through the door. Flip them the bird, absolutely. I can't help myself. I hold up my middle finger to one of them, smile defiantly. I get a blast of high-pitched sound in response. You'll be reprimanded for speaking to me in such a way, Barksdale says to Amy. Cover your ears, Barksdale shouts, walking away towards the far end of the room. Stay put until you hear back from me. Thank you, Amy says with fire in her voice. She then turns to me and says, Better do what the man says. I'ma cover my ears. I don't care. I clap my hands over my ears just in time to protect my hearing from a deafening blast. I can still feel my blood rushing out and wonder if this is what Dennis felt like at the beginning of his end. Before the sorrow of losing Dennis can consume me, something slaps against the wall of the room with tremendous force. I assume this is just another of the monsters slithering along the wall, but when I turn back towards the door, I hear something surprising. More bursts of a loud, explosive noise start ringing out. Looking through the peephole again, I see the core of one of the beasts explode. It vanishes in a puff of smoke and clear liquid. Looking to my left, I see Barksdale in a shooting stance on the far side of the room. He's firing through a small slit in the wall. He's using some high-powered weapon, the likes of which I've never seen. I see a slight movement as the gun kicks, accompanied by a flicker of white light. Immediately, another monster is down, its tentacles flailing around aimlessly as most of its core is torn through. I instantly feel gratitude and an immense satisfaction in knowing that we are being picked off in such a way. I instantly feel gratitude and immense satisfaction in knowing that they're being picked off in such a way. Uh, we're gonna sit down. No, we're gonna continue watching. No, they killed Dennis. We're gonna watch them die. I slide my up to the peep. I slide my eye up to the peephole again to watch what effect the shots are having outside. Because I know that the white liquid and gas is the creature's blood, seeing it draws up a frenzied bloodlust in me. Another is blasted in the center, the translucent shell collapsing inwards as its lights die out. Yet another is shot in a mass of floating tentacles, causing its body to disappear as it dips in and out of existence. After several moments, my view is blocked by a splatter of white liquid that covers my peephole. When the firing is over, I barely even notice it. Soon after, Barksdale walks back over to our side of the room. They're all gone, Barksdale says, and I have resealed the hangar doors. How'd you kill them like that, I ask. Classified weapons that, quite frankly, have no business being near. Amy gets to her feet and returns to the panel on the wall. Thanks. How badly is the civilian hurt? Barksdale asks Amy, as if I'm not good enough for him to speak to. A nasty cut, Amy answers. If he gets some quick attention, he'll be okay. Okay, I'll have Strickland get the med kit. Strickland survived? Amy asks, sounding cheerful. Yeah, and until you and your friend showed up, I thought we were the only ones. Hang tight, she's on her way. With that said, he retreats away to the back of the room, as if he can't stand to be around us. Amy approaches me and looks me over. You're in good hands. Strickland will be able to fix you up. Is she a doctor or something? Sort of. She's also a physicist, but oddly enough, she spent time as a trauma nurse in the army. Is Strickland a friend of yours? I ask. Amy chuckles. Yeah, we've known each other for a while. The only woman in a sea of overachieving men. Barksdale sounds kind of like a prick. Not gonna lie. That's because he is, Amy says. But he runs the place, so he sort of has the right. Yeah, Washington or a facility buried under the woods of Kentucky. Gender roles stay the same, she says, rolling her eyes. Within a few seconds, the door behind us opens, and a woman appears from further back in the chamber. She enters this room without she enters the room with what looks like a small suitcase. She's dressed in a very basic and drab military getup, complete with a holstered sidearm. My name is Connie Strickland, she says, getting straight to the point. I can patch up pretty good but it's gonna hurt. I'm not honestly not caring how much it hurts. My God, I just wanna get out of here to get home. Sit down and let's see if we can get your shirt off, Strickland says. I sit down slowly and start unbuttoning my shirt. She has to help me slip it off over my shoulders, but we manage. How bad is it? I ask. Bad, 
she says. It's almost looked like a burn, but I've seen much worse. I might as well talk to Strickland, if only to distract myself from the pain. You're a scientist, too? Strickland rolls her eyes as she gathers up a needle and some thread. I was always into fringe science. I started in labs where there were eccentric Russian scientists being funded by the U.S. to work on combining DNA types. I sort of become obsessed with perfecting human physiology while I was a trauma nurse in the army. So you were a bad scientist then, I say. I get that a lot, but no, not compared to the stuff we do here. What kind of stuff? It's complicated. Coma masses, quantum gravity, crunching things down into their Schwarzschild radiuses. Fun stuff. Yeah, mad scientist, I say, trying to keep myself calm with dry humor. There are lots of small labs working on the same stuff, she argues. They just don't have our funding. When you guys run in here... When you guys ran in here, she says, I was horrified. Those barrels outside? I'm not sure if you saw them. Well, if you'd shot them, it could have been bad. Why, I ask. The gray ones? They're filled with an experimental fuel that is highly flammable. The yellow ones contain liquid nitrogen. What? I ask, just lying around? Well, this area is the safest in the building. The most secure. Well, it used to be anyway. And take this, she says, handing me four pills. Painkillers. They won't work immediately, but they'll do the worst of what you're feeling. Are these the best idea? I ask. Won't they make me dizzy or out of sorts or something? All I get in response is an annoyed and determined look. Alright, so unless they're narcotics, the painkillers aren't going to do shit. So just take the painkillers. I dry swallow the pills as she starts working on me. She slathers the wound with some sort of liquid that stings like crazy and I gasp. Just grin and bear it. Might as well. Ready to stab me yet? Strickland asks. I'm fine, I hiss. I grit my teeth in pain and try to catch my breath. The anticipation is the worst part. I'm relieved to find that it doesn't hurt as much as I feared. It's no picnic for sure, but compared to the fire-like pain in my wound, it's bearable. So, you and Barksdale are the only survivors? Amy asks. It seems that way. Those don't... Those that didn't disappear into thin air were killed by those things, Strickland says, nodding to the secured door. We already know no one else made it, so how many were killed? I'm guessing 30 or so, Strickland says. I'm not sure how many were scheduled to come in today. I'm glad to see you. Where were you when it happened? Amy asks. I was in the micro lab on level two, Strickland replies. Park and O'Brien were in there with me and they just disappeared, I guess. It looks like they were being stretched, distorted. And then there was a ball of white light and they were gone. The ball of white light just annihilated everything it touched. Would it leave a perfectly round hole? I ask, a light bulb turning on in my head. We saw some of those up at the logging site. That was probably the same phenomenon, Strickland replies. Amy looks like a child afraid to ask an adult for something. Finally, she asks, where did they go? We don't know. Strickland says. It could have been an infinite number of different dimensions, or even some dimensions that merge and mix together. It could also be a place that exists between dimensions. Barksdale calls it the void. <laughs> I'd call it dead. No, she says. We keep tabs on the heart rate, blood pressure, breathing of all the rats and human test objects. Wherever they go for that time, they are still very much alive. I winced through the rest of Strickland's stitching, feeling the tug of my skin, but thankfully, no more flowing blood. Finally, Strickland says, you're good to go. I slide my shirt back on, aware of the thick pad of gauze that Strickland applied to my shoulder. So, have you and Barksdale been able to contain all those creatures? Amy asks. Strickland appears shocked, clearly not the reaction Amy was expecting. Contain? Are you nuts? Do you not know what's happening? Amy's eyes widen and fearful fearful confusion. What do you mean? What, what's happening uh, other than the initial experiment failure? The anomalies are becoming more numerous, farther from the source, Strickland says. The casual humor in her voice is now gone. Further from the source? From the location of the original experiment, she says. The experiment caused the first doorway to open, but it set off a chain reaction. They are gaining momentum along geodesic emanating from the facility. 
It's those pockets of exotic matter and negative energy that are letting those things in. What the hell does that mean? I ask. It means, Amy chimes in, that those doorways and monsters are starting to appear all over the facility, maybe even the surface. Not yet, luckily, Strickland says, but the doorway will start appearing on the surface and it won't stop there. The anomaly's reach could extend infinitely as far as we know. Those entities will appear on the surface in other states, other countries. Holy shit, I say. You mean the world is going to be overrun? The horror of the past few hours has made me ready to believe anything. But this is almost too much. Unfortunately, yes, Strickland says. My god, Amy says, stepping away. Isn't there anything we can do? That is a last resort. Strickland says, her eyes darting over to Barksdale at the back of the room. There's an emergency failsafe switch. What? Amy says. I never heard of that. Where? You weren't cleared for it, Strickland replies. And that switch, Amy says, is a way to stop this? Yes, Strickland says, seeming uneasy with the conversation. So why haven't you already pulled this switch? Well, there are two problems with hitting it, Strickland says. The switch is our eraser. It destroys the entire facility and terminates any systems or experiments that are being conducted. It's also an emergency shutdown for interdimensional travel. It puts an event horizon around the facility. What, what the hell is that? I ask incredulous. It's the perimeter of a black hole, she replies. The boundary inside which nothing can escape, not even light. So the first problem is we'd all be killed sucked into the black hole before we'd have time to evacuate. The second reason, Strickland whispers suddenly quiet, is that Barksdale won't allow it. What? Amy gasps. Why not? He wants to allow those, those things to flood the surface? Thousands? Millions will die! Strickland puts her hands up, silencing Amy. They both peer over to the far side of the room where Barksdale has his back turned. I know. I know. He says he doesn't care. He says he'll be happy to be rid of the oversight so he could continue his work. The oversight? Amy almost screams, regaining control over her voice when Strickland gives her another look of warning. You mean our government? She asks. He's aware this could disrupt, even topple our government, and he doesn't care. Strickland sighs. Boxdale is, well, he's off the range right now. He's gone rogue, and he's armed. This comment makes me look towards a shotgun I brought in with me, nearly forgotten in the last few moments. While Barksdale has his back turned to us, I take it in my hands and slide it behind me. Just in time, too, as Barksdale walks over from the back of the room to our side of the chamber. He gives Strickland a suspicious look before speaking to her. Is the civilian going to survive? He asks. Yes, he's stitched up, good to go, Strickland replies. That's great news, Barksdale says. I'm sitting right here, I say sarc sarcastically. You can actually speak to me, you know. Amy, it's quite nice to see that you've survived. He says, where are the others? The aloof way this asshole is talking to us is getting under my skin. Um, a guy named Marcus that works on the first level for my tea, Amy says. It's all I know for sure. Marcus Papsko, Barksdale says. Where's he? We're not sure, I say. He was separated from us. Oh, Barksdale replies, clearly taken aback by my stern reply. That's unfortunate. Barksdale seems to think about something and then looks directly at me. You're with the logging crew, aren't you? Remind me, how'd you get in here again? We fell through a hole. Ah, right. We lost our primary power source and the experiment failed, Barksdale says. Experiment failure created those exotic matter pockets, that hole you fell into. And if there were enough of them, it may have opened a way into our facility. Depending on the power source that was damaged, Barksdale continued, could have also shut down the locking systems before backup kicked in. Everything is starting to make sense now. From the very start, it had seemed peculiar that we'd been so easily able to walk into a place like this. Where is the rest of our crew? Maybe there's one left. Your crew? Barksdale asked. Frank and Joe? They're gone. G gone? Gone where? I asked, my voice trembling. Hearing them speak the names of my crew enrages me. They were annihilated by antimatter pockets created during the failure. A bright ball of light. In the aftermath, all you'd see would be a round hole in the ground. Barksdale says this like he's sharing yesterday's sports scores. I let my face crumble into my hands. I had suspected this. All this time, you were already dead. 
Well, what now? How do we get out of here alive? Now it's time to continue our work, Barksdale says calmly, turning away to the instruments on the near wall. All right, so this guy is armed and off his rocker. So we're going to keep quiet, not enrage him. This guy sounds like a complete lunatic, but he's a lunatic that's accustomed to power and armed with some, some type of advanced weaponry. So I keep my intentions unspoken, assuming Barksdale is used to going unchallenged by people he considers beneath him. He certainly seems like that type. I want to continue my work, Barksdale muses. Other researchers will eventually discover what we have sure, but I want it to be me. This is my laboratory. These are my experiments. The work I've led here will earn me my place in history. And quite frankly, I don't need to explain it to you. Up on the surface, they'll struggle to defend themselves since they won't know or won't know what they're dealing with. I have the necessary weapons. After a few months, who knows? Maybe I'll decide the world is ready for me to help them, and we'll go from there. He turns his back to us as he says this, walking to the far end of the chamber like we're some kind of distraction. Amy takes this opportunity to whisper to us. We need to hit that switch, she says. It's the only option. What he's saying is murder, treason, genocide. She looks over to Strickland for support, trailing off. But Strickland looks at the ground, clearly torn. She won't look anyone in the eye. It makes an effort not to look at Barksdale. He seems distracted with whatever instruments he's studying on the far side of the room. The dreamlike quality I experienced earlier is wearing off. Painkillers seem to be losing their edge. Strickland finally whispers a response. Even if we decide that we want to hit that switch, Barksdale won't allow us. <laughs> to hell with him. Amy agrees. Where is the switch located? She asks. There's an elevator out in the hangar, Strickland says. Take it to the basement. The switch is at the end of the long tunnel, you... But Strickland never finishes. Two things happen at once as she speaks, her mouth stopping in mid-sentence. First, a loud booming noise rings out, and then the top of her head seems to explode. Amy screams out in surprise, and I jump back in shock as Strickland's body collapses beside me. Behind her fallen body, Barksdale is holding his experimental rifle and now he's pointing it at us. Oh no, I'm so glad I didn't anger him earlier. I wonder if Barksdale is even crazier than Marcus. He just shot a woman that worked for him to keep her quiet. Surely he won't have an issue with killing me. Now, Barksdale yells, no more whispering, no more secrets. You two will stay in here. And get away from that door. If anyone whispers one more thing, I'll blow your heads off. My mind is racing to figure out a way to get through the secure door and into the hangar. Beyond that, of course, there was the failsafe switch. Oh, man. Make a distraction or insult him. What would insult? I, I have to go the insult route. I just want to know what happens. Maybe I can insult him enough to let his guard down? I think he's just going to kill me no other ideas, I resort to something I know how to do well. Be noisy. You moron, I say. For someone in such a position of power, you'd think like an idiot. Kill me. Go ahead. But then you better get someone out into those woods to move my equipment. You really want the police snooping around a wrecked logging site for missing loggers? If someone as dumb as me found my way into your little hi hideout... My rant is having its intended effect. Barksdale's teeth clench and rage fills his eyes. You're a fool, he shouts. You don't have the slightest idea how difficult the work we do here is. How advanced and world-changing. Okay, a couple things here. A couple things I want to mention. A, I don't think the police are going to come looking for the loggers when the entire world is overrun by white things. I'm just saying, I just don't think that that's really going to be something he has to worry about. So your entire threat has no basis. God, Roger's dumb. Let's keep him talking. For now. You scientists think you're so smart, I interrupt. But you have no common sense. All the knowledge in the world is useless if you have no moral compass. Barksdale is starting to lose control. His breathing intensifies. If you think for one moment that you could do as quickly as I can, I raise my gun and fire. I don't even take aim. I just fire in Barksdale's general direction. Barksdale takes off running as my shot misses wide. 
He runs for cover to the back of the room. That's all we need. Amy also fires a shot to keep him under cover as we head for the door. Amy pushes a button and the door swings open. Barksdale will be on us in a second, so we dash out into the hangar, ready to defend ourselves. Amy and I run as fast as we can through the rows of barrels. Barksdale comes charging out of the chamber almost immediately. As he steps onto the hangar floor, he starts shooting. Each shot sends a jolt of fear through me as I wait for a bullet to end my life. We need to get to the elevator at the far side of the room, Amy tells me. It leads down below to the switch. He's got super crazy... Oh, he has got that, that gun, but against two of us, we could probably take him out. Let's fend him off first. If we could get rid of him first, that'd be better. Since we, you know, tend to leave things unfinished. We both lean out from the cover of the barrels and take several shots at Barksdale. He steps back into the isolation chamber, which gives me a sense of victory. But then I realize he may just be reloading whatever high-powered weapon he has. We need to move, I say. Agreed, Amy says. We both take off at a full sprint for the other side of the hangar. Somehow, I make it through the rows of barrels and get to the elevator's entrance. I turn back to allow Amy to enter first, but she isn't there. I look back to the barrels and see that she has fallen about halfway down the row. She doesn't appear to be hurt, but she is paralyzed with fear, sitting motionlessly as Barksdale peppers the area with gunfire. See if we can make him hide again. Let's shoot at Barksdale. I step back out and try to get a clean shot at Barksdale, but the angle's all wrong. I try my best to get off a shot, but it's not anywhere near him. Barksdale doesn't even flinch. I'll have to help Amy from here. I then remember the contents of the barrels. One color has highly flammable fuel. The other contains liquid nitrogen. I'm no scientist, but I'm pretty sure liquid nitrogen is mostly harmless unless you have direct contact. If one of those barrels gets shot and the liquid nitrogen spills out, I'm fairly positive it will simply evaporate. That could create a cover of sorts for Amy, like a smoke cloud. Ah, hell. But which of the barrels holds the liquid nitrogen? Strickland told us, but... I can't remember. I have to remember quickly or Barksdale's going to get careless with his shooting and we could all die. Oh man, which one was it? Oh wait, hold on, I gotta think. Was it the gray barrels or the yellow barrels? Which one did she tell us first? The first one was the really highly flammable ones. I think that was the yellow barrels. Shoot the gray ones. Shoot the gray. Woo! Gray. Pretty sure the gray barrels have liquid nitrogen in them. Regardless, I don't have time to second guess myself. I take aim and pull the trigger, trigger hitting a gray barrel 20 feet or so away from Amy. There's nothing at first, and just as I wonder if I hit an empty barrel, there's a deafening explosion- A fire! No! It knocks me to my ass and I can hear Amy screaming. As flame and debris rain over me, my heart sinks. It wasn't the gray barrels. I just shot a barrel full of fuel. I stand up feeling that the hairs on my arms have been singed slightly from the fire. I can see Amy out there. Her leg is on fire. She's doing everything she can to roll it out, but everywhere she rolls, there's more fire. Just as I'm about to run to help her, I hear a gunshot. I freeze for a moment, assuming the shot is meant for me. But as I watch, a large red hole blooms in Amy's back. No! As she topples over, I glance up to see Barksdale with his gun, proud of his kill. Sorrow and fury boil up within me but I have to keep it under control. I have to get to that switch. With Amy gone, there's nothing else for me to do here. I turn away from the hangar and head to the elevator. My nerves are drenched in fear and adrenaline. When I reach out to press the call button on the elevator, it feels like I'm watching someone else do it. I step inside the doors, and the doors close. The motors on the elevator sound like dying dogs. As the elevator slides down, the light from the flames give way to complete blackness. And now I'm on my own. Oh, I can't believe I killed Amy! This is so bad. Wow, everything just went really bad. I lose track of how long the elevator descends. It's hard to tell due to the lack of lighting, but it must go another 500 feet underground. 
The elevator comes to a stop with a shuddering clang, and I waste no time exiting. The tunnel stretches out with sparse white bulbs lighting the way. Most of the wall is made of raw earth and rock, but there are boards and concrete slathered in areas used to reinforce the tunnel. I see a warning sign posted on the wall. I want to read it, but there's not much time. Ah, just head through the tunnel. No time to read. There's no time. That switch is down the tunnel. It has to be flipped no matter what. Suddenly, I feel the effects of the painkillers again. My head feels like a balloon and my balance is off kilter. I look up and when I see that the tunnel ceiling is less than six inches over my head, claustrophobia freezes me for a moment. Still, it's much better than facing the monsters above me. I wonder then, walking through the darkness, where they came from. Is the portal still open? The bulbs do little to thwart the darkness. I hold the gun in one hand and reach out to touch the wall with the other. Feeling the wall under my palm anchors me to reality, to sanity. I'm not in some boundless abyss, but still in the real world. For a little while longer, at least. I recognize that I am marching to my end. As much as I wish I weren't, it's not surprising. From the moment I saw what those creatures could do to time and space, at least a part of me knew that death was inevitable. Before I have time to wonder whether my family will really miss me, I see a light ahead. It's nothing more than a speck of blue light, but in the darkness of the tunnel, it's like a lighthouse on a stormy sea. I slog forward, my eyes straining to focus on that little light ahead. From somewhere ahead, I start to hear something that sounds like water. It is trickling slightly, like a leaky faucet. And behind that, there is something that sounds like wind, a light breeze through an open field, and a voice. Anywhere else, the sounds would have been pleasant, but here in the blackness of the tunnel, they're menacing. We're staying quiet. We've been quiet so long, or this far. I don't make a sound. Instead, trying to make sense of what's going on around me. I cock my head trying to concentrate, and then realize that I can see the tunnel walls now. This is odd, as I wasn't able to see them a few seconds ago. This is different from the blue light at the end of the tunnel. It's then that I see the slight shimmering in the air. It looks like a foggy mirror steamed over after a shower. And it's moving, dancing in the air like some abstract firefly. It's not menacing like the creatures, so that threat is a null. It's peaceful, serene. I watch as the shimmer branches out and becomes two, then three, then four. They snake out in different directions, tracing the tunnel walls. Are these shimmers the doors to another dimension that Strickland was talking about? Suddenly, I'm surrounded by light above and below me and realize there's no avoiding it. The question is, how am I going through? Well, if it completely singes you off, go in feet first. You can lose a foot, not a head. Unable to resist, I step forward to where the tunnel wall should be. When I do, those shimmering lights branch out even more before connecting in one perfect circular form. They're hypnotizing, so much so that I don't realize that the tunnel walls are vanishing. I feel something like wind, and a brief electrical pulse pass through me as the lights take me. There is then a very gentle pushing sensation, and I somehow know that I'm being expelled. I've passed through something. Maybe the lights, maybe the tunnel walls, I don't know. But the shimmering lights fade a bit, still dancing in the air, but no longer land uh, large and branching out. And as my eyes adjust, I see right away that I am no longer standing in that dark tunnel far beneath the hangar. I have no idea where I am. I'm just somewhere else. And I'm terrified. The ground I land on looks like hot coals. There are dips and many cliffs breaking the landscape ahead of me. There's a wash of orange and blue overhead in a sky that makes no sense. It is both beautiful and terrifying at once. A scattering of stars hang overhead, and they all seem to be breathing, pulsing with a gentle energy, as if alive. I can't tell if there are clouds in the sky, because everything about it 
from the colors to the trembling horizon line, seems to be amorphous. Everything is knitted together, living. I stare a moment, longer, and I can swear I feel the sky breathing. Far off to my right, I see what looks to be a plume of fire, small yet bright, with no source of fuel. It looks as if the ground itself is creating the flame. Several more of these flames dot the landscape further out. The air is thick and muggy. Then I realize something horrible. I don't know if what I'm breathing here resembles air at all. In a place like this, one of impossible beauty but also very stark horror, my mind doesn't know what to do. A wave of nausea comes over me and I think I might be sick. I'm not sure if it would be better to fight it or to give in. The white light that brought me here is nowhere to be found. Is anyone else even here? Is there any way to escape? All right, we're not gonna go to an alien world and yell. We're just gonna look around, see what we can see. I continue to look out at this nightmarish landscape and see a few other unexplainable oddities. There are billowing flames in the distance, not like a volcano or explosions, just some kind of slow heat crawling upwards that defies reality. This analogy seems even more fitting when I see the thin, vein-like roots of the fire twisting into the ground and then darting back out in all directions. I get that sick feeling again in my gut and realize my mind just needs something to focus on. It's then that I hear a voice. It is faint, distant. I turn and hear it coming out of one of the massive crevices along the ground. Inside of that crack, about ten feet down, a very pale man lies on a ledge. He's human, but looks close to death. He's in the center of a large pool of blood, and his left leg has been twisted and torn in an unnatural way. As I walk to the ledge, he looks up and sees me. Help me, please, the man says. His eyes are wide, although everything about him speaks of weakness. He is close to death, or insanity, or both. Who are you? I'm Dr. Kana. He strains to get out. I work in the facility. Please, help. I want to know more, but it seems cruel to steal what looks like his last breaths just to answer my questions. I'd love to, I respond. But I don't know where the hell I am or how to get back home. The light, he says. It's a doorway. It might take you back to the facility. Um, might? Hmm. Where did it go? They come. Come and go. They'll be back. Now please, help me. I desperately want to help, but there's no way I can reach him. His ledge is too far away, above the pools of fire. I don't think I can get to you, I say. No, that's not what I mean, he replies. His eyes are on the shotgun that I almost forgot I'm still holding. I realize what he wants and I shake my head. I can't. I say, I can't do that. Please, he pleads. Those things. They have the others that came here with me. I got dropped along the way. They'll be back. They'll be back and they'll kill me. That, he says again, indicating the gun, will be quicker, less painful. I can't, I repeat. Please, look at my damn leg. I'm dead anyway. I'm about to refuse him again when I hear an all too familiar static sound out from another crevice behind him. I hear another of those shrill noises and then watch as one of the monsters materialize up out of the neighboring crevice. Two more come out after it, then a third, then a fifth, then ten. Soon I lose count as what was just a few turns into a flood. And I suddenly understand the man's reasoning. A bullet would be a mercy. I check the gun and see that I have only one round left. I can use it on this guy, but I may need it for myself later. From behind me, the man pleads again. My God, he says, a waver of lunacy in his voice. Please. Ah, <sighs> yep, gonna shoot him. That is an absolute mercy. That is horrifying. It's horrible, horrifying. It's, it's horror all around. I look back to the man and wince. I know it's the right thing to do, but my finger resists. With a roar of disgust, I level the gun towards his head, turn my eyes away, and then pull the trigger. 
Your aim is true. The man crumbles lifelessly to the ground. And that's when I see the shimmers wavering to my right, in the direction I originally came from. I look back to the monsters and see that they have now noticed me. Some of them begin floating up the walls of the crevice. There are less than ten feet separating us. The shimmers of white light are within arm's reach, its movements reminding me of a fish in an aquarium. I reach out and feel myself accepted by them again. I feel the sensation of wind and wait for the feeling of being pushed out back to the tunnel in the facility. But it doesn't. It doesn't come this time. This time, I feel something else. I feel a tugging sensation that seems to want to drag me in all directions at once. As the world goes dark, I realize that I'm somewhere else, and it is not the darkness of the tunnel. This is the darkness of a total void. There is darkness around me, everywhere. Nothingness. I feel nothing under my feet, nothing to my sides. I can't touch or sense anything at all. I don't even know which way is up or down. It's as though I'm all that exists. And I remain there. I just hear silence, not even the sound of my heartbeat. The blackness is so deep that I feel I can't distinguish between my thoughts and what is real. I hear screaming, but I can't tell if it's someone else or my mind screaming to fill the void. Let's try to move. I try to kick and move my arms. It's not working. But it's not clear in what way it's not working. Are my limbs not moving? Or have they gone numb? It's impossible to tell. My body has just become absent of all sensation. I assume this is the place that Strickland referred to. The place between dimensions. This darkness could consume me if I wanted it to. I try to will myself out of it, to have those shimmering lights spit me out, but it isn't happening. At this point, my mind starts to hallucinate, or at least I think it does. Are they visions? My mind playing tricks on me? I can't tell. All I can do is watch. I see the logging site, and Tony's legs still pinned under the dozer. I feel a pang of regret that I had left him in such a state. I see myself talking to Dennis and him blowing up at me for not telling him Tony was gone. Then the scene rearranges itself, and I'm standing between Dennis and Marcus's gun. It changes again in the shape of Marcus lies on the ground, still hell-bent on revenge even after I let him live. In my mind, I'm sobbing as I watch Dennis get torn apart by those monsters all over again, and I just stood by and watched. And I try to let out a scream as I watch myself shoot the wrong barrel, blowing Amy to hell, but there's still no sound. And just when I feel like I can't take any more of this, I see the man in that strange world begging for death. I watch as I take his life just before those beasts reach him. All of these things are flooding my mind, and it feels like my brain is vomiting. Yet in the midst of it all, I see what's really important, the switch. In my mind's eye, I see that glowing light in the tunnel, the one far ahead, small and distant. I'm gonna try to relax. Let it happen. I have no control here. I can't understand how I can do anything in this place, so I just try to embrace it, empty my mind. That light that brought me here is back. It's becoming brighter, shining through that image in the tunnel. With that, I feel the wind again, a light breeze that seems to come from everywhere. And then with a relief that I can only imagine feels like death, I move forward. I'm ejected from the void, and I'm suddenly standing in the tunnel again. I let out a wail of triumph that turns into a bout of weeping. The weeping only intensifies when I see that light up ahead, a flickering blue light. Somewhere behind me, I hear a crackling noise. The monsters from that other place, they have come through. But not at the same time. They've gone down the tunnel the other way in search of me. And now, because of my crying, they know I was here. I feel like I can listen to get a better read on where they are, 
Or I can just make a break for it. We're just gonna make a break for it. We just need to get to that switch. I don't even bother looking back. There's no time. Instead, I run with all of my might straight ahead. My focus on that little blue light ahead of me. As I run, I see a different light. A white one, flickering in my peripheral vision. It's another one of those shimmers that go to other worlds. It seems they are appearing and disappearing with more frequency now. Strickland was right. These things could reach the surface soon, unleashing more monsters. This thought makes me refocus on the blue light, the man-made light, the switch. The blue light gets closer, and as it does, I can make out a square shape around it. This has to be it. The familiar static scream of the monsters is much closer now. I have to be quick. I grip the gun tightly, regretting my decision to use the last bullet on the man in the other world. Looks like all I'll, I'll be using this for is a bludgeon. I run ahead into the darkness, my eyes locked on the switch that I assume is going to kill not only the creatures, but myself as well. As I approach, I see the lever. It's covered by a glass box that I'll need to break. The blue light is directly beneath this, highlighting a series of tubes and wires that snake into the inner workings of the device. In the middle is blackness. Not like a darkly colored part of the machine, but just a hole in reality. It looks like some sort of illusion. All the while, I can hear the static of the creatures coming up dangerously close now. I have no idea how much time I have. Smash the glass. We are making a mad dash for it. We gotta get it done. I draw back the stock of the gun and smash through the glass box that houses the lever. The glass shattering is like music to my ears. I reach out for the lever, my hand grasping it. Without warning, I feel immense pain course through my body. It feels like fire racing down my back, causing me to fall to one knee in agony. There's only one of them, that I can see. It blasts horrible static noise at me as I ready my gun. With no bullets left, I get ready to make use of it as a club. I try to strike. The monster bats the gun away, warping it into an S shape, but then follows up by swinging its appendage at me. The sting of its touch forces me back against the side of the cavern, my face striking the wall hard. My jaw crunches, and I feel a sharp pain encompass my head. Then the creature is upon me. Its tentacles melt into me, and I scream. I can't help it. I sound like a wild animal. I can try to keep fending them off, or I can go for broke and just focus on the lever. Creatures be damned. Well, we're all gonna die anyway, so we need the lever. That's the important thing. I put all of my strength into my legs. The moment the monster in front of me draws back its eel-like arms to grab me, I pivot backwards. My back strikes the machine, sending agony rocketing through my body. I'm so thankful I broke the glass before this moment, before the coming violence. I stretch out, grab the lever. With one last desperate scream that shreds my voice, jam it down. The tunnel is suddenly filled with a flash of intense darkness. It expands from the switch, swallowing the matter around it. At first, I'm sure this is the end of me. I expect the darkness to consume me, followed by death. But then another shimmer of dancing white light appears next to me. There are more of those streams of light they rip in space like the ones that previously sent me to that other ungodly world in the void. With nothing else to do but die, I try to escape into the shimmer. When that stream of light envelops me, the expanding darkness of the switch is gone, and I feel a huge push. My body feels stretched, collapsing like I'm falling in all directions at once. The world goes white, and then there are pinpoints of stars everywhere. One of them breezes directly by my right, and I see something that looks like a spiral galaxy, distorted in its folds. To my right, I see an endless stretch of stars and gas clouds forming some galactic architecture. But beyond the immeasurable beauty, I notice something. I'm seeing the same star patterns over and over, they're repeating, like reflections in an endless mirror. Are these different versions of the same galaxies? The same realities? To my left, I see a calm blue world and can barely make out trees. Familiar Kentucky trees that I've been around for the last few weeks. To my right, I see a copy, 
an orange world. And there are trees there as well, but something is strange, disturbing. As I zoom by, I'm not sure how much control I have in this unusual place, but if I can direct myself, it's worth trying. Well, we're going for the blue world. That one sounds safe, or at least safer. I don't know, that music didn't sound too, too good. I try to focus my mind on heading towards the blue world, not knowing what to expect. My breath escapes me for a moment. Everything is dark and peaceful, and nothing hurts. With breath back inside my body, I gasp and open my eyes. I'm back. Back at the logging site. How? I'm not sure. Did the shimmers react with the implosion of the switch? Some other accident? I have no idea. I sit up right away and become instantly dizzy. I wonder if I'm somehow back in time before we found the facility. But what happens next makes me realize that can't be true. There's a tremor in the ground. Somewhere off in the distance, I hear a metallic groan. The buried facility is being ripped apart under the ground by the activation of the switch. I hear trees splintering and popping all around me, and then there's the muffled sound of an implosion. A huge group of trees is falling, followed by a massive plume of dust and debris. There's no way Barksdale and Marcus survived. Good riddance. I look in the direction where I found Dennis sitting, before this all started. It's then that I remember that he's gone, along with Amy. I'm still not sure how I got out of that facility alive. That, I suppose, is the most important thing. Alone, but alive. It's then that I look up and notice the sky. The sky is beautiful and familiar unobstructed by the trees that had been standing several minutes ago. I take my trusty hard hat off my head and exhale, letting my body relax. It's finally over. I'm not sure how long it will take me to get back some semblance of a life, but I know one thing for sure. Any day above ground is going to be a good day. The end. The end? The end. The end. <sighs> so, uh, hola. there are a lot of, um, but then if you think, um, you see, okay. Wow, just a lot to unpack, a lot to think about. Okay, I made it out. We survived with our hard hat. With the hard hat from the very beginning, we made it out and survived. Woohoo for us, but oh my god, I can't believe I killed Dennis! I can't believe I killed Amy by choosing the wrong barrel! The goddamn barrels! How could I get that wrong? I'm so mad at myself on that one. Just stupid freaking barrels! Okay, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I am so very excited. Okay, so the last statistics here. Tough it out. Even 36% of players decided to take the painkillers. Hmm, low percent. Who survives? You and 38% of players <laughs> didn't shoot the right barrel. Me and 38% of players were idiots and we killed Amy. Mercy, you and 30% of players mercifully killed the man who asked for death. Wow, that's a low percentage. I hope like if I was in that situation, I hope I would get that mercy. And then going home, you and 83% of players headed towards the blue world and went home. So I wonder what would have happened if I chose the orange world. Uh, it said something was wrong about it, but was it wrong just because it was different? Maybe if I went back there, maybe I could have gone back in time. Maybe since the different reality, maybe my people would have still been there. Maybe that was the right choice to make. I don't know. Man. Okay, well, so we don't have very many answers, but we do know that the beings were from different dimensions, different realities, and we were able to throw the safety switch, killing ev absolutely everybody. But we escaped into a shimmer and then got spit back out. That concerns me because if I was able to escape, then that means somebody else could have escaped as well. Not just Dennis or Barksdale, but maybe one of those monsters. But I don't know. Hopefully not. <laughs> well, I 
loved this game and I am totally going to play this on my own again probably multiple times to see what happens through the different actions. I honestly didn't think like that much was going to be different for, through my actions but once I accidentally killed Dennis I realized that our actions really do have a lot of weight to them. So I'm super excited to replay it and see what changes. So thank you guys so much for listening along with me. I hope you enjoyed this. I thought this was such a cool game. I thought this was such a cool story. It's so well told. I absolutely loved reading through it and figuring out what's going on and stuff. So I hope you guys enjoyed it too. If you know of any games like this, I would love for you to let me know in the comments. I want to do more of these because I just really enjoy these choice-based kind of uh, games. So let me know what you have for me and I'll definitely play them. All right, guys. Well, thanks for coming along and I will see you guys later on. Bye, guys.